You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and tech. Where we hunt ancient treasure maps for sunken ships filled with jewels earmarked for music technology startups. Where we bow down to startup ninjas and samurai whose PowerPoint prowess are only topped by their linguistic magic that makes investors cry out to write $10 million checks. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the founder and CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, a music and tech PR firm. On this episode, we broadcast a recording of the music investor panel from the first annual Music Tectonics Conference which took place in Los Angeles on October 28th and 29th, 2019. Let me introduce you to our panelists. Sherry Hu runs the music tech newsletter and podcast Water and Music, and her reporting on the music industry appears regularly in publications like Billboard, Forbes, and Music Business Worldwide. Sherry moderated the panel. On the panel, you'll hear first from Rishi Patel of Plus 8 Equity. Rishi co-founded Plus 8 with influential members of the electronic music community, John Aquaviva and Richie Houghton, to fund early stage music technology and new digital media companies. Our next panelist is Zach Katz, CEO of Raised in Space Enterprises, a technology and music investment group founded in 2019 in partnership with Zach Katz, Shara Senderoff, Scooter Bronze, Ithaca Holdings, and Ripple's X-Spring. Panelist Larry Marcus is Managing Director at Marcy Venture Partners, a consumer-focused VC. Larry co-founded with Jay-Z, yes, that Jay-Z, and Jay Brown, CEO of Rock Nation. He's also a Managing Director of San Francisco-based Walden Venture Capital. He invested early in media companies that went on to become household names, Pandora and Netflix. And last but not least, you'll hear from Virginie Berger, the founder of DP. DBTH Capital, a fund focused on investments in rights tech, as in don't believe the hype. She's also the co-founder of We Are Music Tech, an organization that connects people and companies in the music ecosystem. Enjoy the panel. We'll jump right in. I also want to start off with like a reality check because this is a music conference. As you all said, music is part of the fabric of society. It does permeate so many aspects of culture. But in terms of like the market size and, and the dollar amount, um, it, I think it is technically a niche in the world of investment. So uh, if you think uh, of like recent IFPI figures, the recorded music market might be worth around like $20 billion in uh, a few years. Uh, PwC said that the live music industry will be worth around $30 billion, $31 billion. So in total, that's um, $50 billion, like what the music industry will be worth in, um, uh, in three years' time. In contrast, uh, predictions about the gaming industry say it's going to be worth almost like five times as much. So some predictions say that the gaming industry alone will actually be worth more than music and film combined. It'll be around 230 to, to 250 million. So if, if we're focusing only on music startups, we're actually working with a, with a really small market. And um, I'm wondering whether you've thought about that and how that might inform your investments in the music space or what you... Uh, think about when you think of a music company or a music startup. This is an open question. If anyone wants to start, well, I can start with that. Um, you know, it's in, in this world of music 2.0, uh, we think very much about how music can be more than just music. You know, and John and I, when we're scouting the world for new opportunities, we think very, very big picture about what music can be and how does it unleash the opportunities. And we have met all sorts of interesting companies that you traditionally wouldn't think are music companies, uh, but f they fit within our thesis. So for example, we invested two years ago in a company called Link, um, which has uh, an incredible technology around geolocation and IoT. Well, how does that relate to music? Well, I can find you in a crowd of 60,000 people at Coachella in five minutes, and no other technology in the world can do that. And we've already gotten interest and purchase orders from groups like the United States military and the United States Air Force. So music is one of the areas in which we can apply this technology, but it, it can be so much more than that. So we think very, very big picture about what music can be and, and take a very, very uh, you know, bird's eye perspective. And so the market size you know, that you cited with your numbers for us is actually quite larger than that when we look at the scope of companies that we're evaluating. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, for, from our end, we've invested into, we started our, our fund in January of this year. We've invested into five companies since the beginning. All of those companies 
originated outside of music and we're helping each and every one of those companies come into music. That's number one. And, and hopefully we will, we will accomplish that. And, and in addition to that, these companies will reach their mission of scaling outside of music. To Sherry's point, which I think is more important because now we know that there's a lot of founders in, in the audience, why does a 17-year-old who loves video games and loves Travis Scott spend $2,500 a year in the gaming world and spend $250 a year in the music world? That is the root of the, of, of the disconnect in the growth of these two industries, and the answer is very, very simple. In the gaming world, first and foremost, the quote-unquote artist, the gamer, just you know, equating that to, to who shows up in the music world, we have an artist, we have a gamer, but they're, they're both the performer, so to speak, shows up to work seven days a week, nine to five or nine to whatever, but they treat their jobs as full-time jobs, whether they feel like it, whether they're inspired, not inspired, it doesn't matter. They're gonna be on camera, they're gonna be engaging their audience, they're gonna be showing up, and because of that connection with the audience that they're willing to build minute by minute, they can ultimately invite uh, audiences to subscribe to watch them play games. They can invite audiences to allow them to buy skins, right? They can allow audiences to, to tip them and be acknowledged. On the other hand, we have the music industry where the artists, and by the way, I, I've spent my entire career living for artists, so I, I couldn't be more pro-artist, but the reality is we have this artist on this other side who has three things to offer in their mind to the fan, which is buy my music, buy my ticket and watch me perform, or buy my t-shirt, or best case scenario, if you're a big artist, buy my tequila. And artists, on top of all of that, want to do as little as possible to ultimately promote and market any one of those three verticals. And until the artist sees themselves and takes on the responsibility of showing up on a daily basis as somebody shows up when they work in an accounting office, at McDonald's or anywhere else, and understands that they have to lean much more deeply into their relationship with the fans, we're gonna continue getting the exact same result. So, sorry. No, all good, keep going. <laughs> anybody, because we have founders in this audience, anybody who believes that they're going to build their business on, on, on the backs of, and with the active participation of artists, stop that thinking immediately. Why does TikTok, why is TikTok what it is? is because artists don't have to show up in ways that they normally don't show up today. They don't have to do anything extra. They live, they create their content, and then you have all of these fans around the world that take that existing content that didn't take any further heavy lifting from the artist, and then they create an entire industry from it. Don't expect artists to show up, rule number one. Uh, that is such an interesting point. Uh, before, okay, I do wanna build on that, but before, I do that. I don't know if you, uh, Virginia or Larry, wanted to build up, yeah, build on that question. I, I just wanted okay. to say, I mean, I think Zach's exactly right about the, the opportunity to monetize because, you know, as an investor, you can look at the world in very simple terms sometimes. You can just say, like, what's your acqu customer acquisition cost and what's your lifetime value or what's your engagement and what's your monetization? And th those are actually two pretty awesome ways to look at the world you know, from my perspective, and if you look at the sports industry or pretty much any industry at the level of engagement, uh, I mean, gaming is incredible engagement, but that monetization gap is just huge. So, you know, there's a lot of problems in the world. I think the question for the companies you're working on is how are you figuring out how to solve that? And I think one of the meta issues in music is because of the rights holders, it can be very hard to innovate in ways to get paid around things like, you know, core pricing, because licenses tend to just say, hey, you know, here's a price. And if you can figure out how to drive that extra layer of monetization, I, I mean, I think it's pretty staggering. But, you know, within music specifically, doing it in a way where you're not, you know, entering into that extra cost of sales. Um, with uh, royalty payments is another important ingredient. These are all great points. You know, I, I'd also throw out another data point and statistic here. In the gaming world, there's about 16 publishers that own all the IP. 
think about that. That's it. You know, you've got Epic Games, you've got Blizzard Activision, and a host of others. In the music world, it's utterly fragmented. It's millions and millions and millions. So, and and it, there's no clarity uh, in terms of who gets paid what when that content is used and where is it used, what country. Welcome to Right Stack. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I did want to direct this to, uh, before building on the point about artists getting involved, to this specifically about Right Stack, right? Because uh, at this point, I think we've, everyone at least on this stage has like sat through multiple panels or seen multiple panels talking about the challenge of uh, building a rights tech company because it is so fragmented and because you have to get so many people um, involved. And there are companies that have been in this space already for four or five years and still haven't gotten that consensus. Some um, companies, because if I take yeah. the example, for example, Music Reports in Los Angeles, sure, yeah. they've been existing for 30 years. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, whereas like new entrants, it's really hard for them to yeah. get that same level of agreement. So from an investor's perspective, where I feel like in the tech world, there's an expectation around product development and growth that's a lot shorter in terms of the time span than that, right? Than like four to five years. Um, how does, so how does that gap influence the types of companies you're investing in? So are you, are you interested in these companies that might take, you know, 30 different parties to sign off before they're even active as a product, or are you looking for something else? <coughs> Sorry, in rights, no, it's more about distribution of, of, of the rights, uh, identification of the rights, um, me making sure that we have um, all the data available, and it's mostly, most of the time, it's not really a tech problem, it's it's really a political problem, or lobbying issues, or you know many other issues, so, um, that's why I don't really believe that um, we can solve the uh, metadata issue with uh, only one company, for example. Mm -hmm. Or we'll solve uh, the uh, identification issue with only one company. So um, most of the time, um, we try to work um, on companies that uh, have a real, real, um, only one problem, actually. Only one, only one solution for one problem. It's... Um, mm -hmm. Um, let's take the example of Unison in Spain. Uh, they are going to compete with a guy. It's uh, the PRO, the equivalent of, of PRO in Spain, because of, of the legislation. Um, same in Europe. We have now uh, a lot of legislation with a CMO directive, with a with a with a copyright directive, and it can be very 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 helpful because now CMOs, it's collective management organization, it's in Europe, it's uh, the equivalent of of, of, PRO, of PRO, if I can say. Um, they have to comply with many obligations by uh, 2021 with transparency, with uh, new rates, with real-time payment, with many other, you know, obligations. So it means that it's a huge opportunity for, for, for startups to help them. And instead of fighting against the system, because most of the time, you know, <laughs> right tech startups are, okay, we are going to change the market, we are going to revolution the market, and they fight against the stakeholders, and it's not really the solution because w they need to work with them. So instead of fighting against uh, stakeholders, it's more interesting to, colla to collaborate with them and to understand how to work with them. You have uh, Dot Blockchain, for example, um, that uh, try also to work with all the stakeholders. You have many companies that can help start startups. Um, look at what's happening with uh, Teosto in Finland. Uh, Teosto is the, the, the PRO in Finland. They work with Revelator and they allow their affiliated to be paid in real time. So it's so absolutely Revelator amazing. So Revelator is an Israeli startup, for those who don't know. Yeah, yeah, so, it's absolutely yeah. yeah it's, so it's absolutely amazing. So it's more about um, you have one issue and what is the problem. But we don't invest in metadata. We don't invest in, yeah, we are going to revolution the licensing issue. Because no, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, super interesting. And... Uh, just to go back super quickly to, to the artist getting involved aspect. So Larry and Rishi, both of you have artists involved in some way, either as like, you know, pass, passive involvement, just, you know, they're investing their money or actively involved with product development. Um, there must be some benefits from that, right, if you're structuring your firm in that way. So I was wondering if you could dive into that. Um, yeah, of course, like artists in the grand scheme of things, they're definitely strapped for cash, and so there's not that much they can pay for as customers. But... Um, on the other side, uh, on the investment side, what kind of benefits do they bring to you? Well, a couple of things. We get a lot of insights from our artist investors. We probably have 
uh, uh, close to 15 of the biggest techno and house music DJs worldwide as investors. Most, you know, many of them go through the, the global circuits through Ibiza, through Berlin, New York, et cetera. And then we have, uh, I can't name the name, but we have one pop star, mega superstar. Um, and, um, you know, it's really interesting because they help us in several ways. One is they give us uh, real-time insight into the mentality of the artist, right? So, you know, what, what are the pain points and challenges of the artist? How is the artist creating music? Um, you know, how are they getting paid? How are they distributing? What are the challenges on tour? Um, are there issues with the way they're selling merchandise? So we get a lot of feedback and insights um, into that. And of course, there's the cachet element, right? When you have some of the top superstar DJs as partners, you know, of course, everybody wants um, someone like Plus Eight uh, or, you know, in Larry's case, Jay Z on on the cap table. Um, but 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 also um, the next level is, you know, post investment. Well, how do they get involved? You know, and and you know, John and I, you know, we're not the we're not um, the guys to necessarily broker a deal between our artist investors and and our companies, but. You know, we kind of take this perspective of, you know, if there's any of our portfolio that one of our artist partners is particularly excited about, and let's say Rich Houghton, our chairman, is really excited about getting more involved with Lander, for example, then, you know, by all means, you know, he should, we, we'll make that connection, we'll set up that meeting, you know, John and I will attend, and, you know, if he wants to do a sample pack and starts doing education tutorials on a, on a creation platform, go for it, you know, and so we, we will help pr um, uh, um, provide the the, uh, the the lubrication, so to speak, between these various parties to come come together. I don't know why I use that word. But <laughs> 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 Makes sense, though. Yeah. <laughs> so in our case, you know, uh, J and J really wanted to be in the VC business because they were having incredible access and they have incredible instincts. And so I'm kind of bringing. I've been um, a VC like in a, a, a VC for a long time. And you know, bring a track record and and the portfolio and deal side, you know, and my own set of instincts and access and all that to the table, and uh, you know, so the focus is is really around much broader thinking on, um, you know, how do you take that entertainment IP and turn it into business IP, and I think my partners have been pretty exceptional at that, and there's a lot that's going on you know, more broadly, like, you know, if you look at a company like Savage X, where Rihanna, you know, isn't just a music star, but she's actually a fashion icon, you know, and, and has sort of a, you know, a, a deeper interest in cultural impact. And there's plenty of artists that are realizing, hey, it's not necessarily just about music, but, you know, what are other businesses that they can get into? Um, so, you know, we're not, marketing around, you know, there's any in-kind, you know, Jay-Z's not, you know, gonna rap about your company and wear your t-shirts and stuff. <laughs> you know, it's really more like we're able to offer, you know, a different, you know, network and a different kind of thinking. And if we're on your cap table, you know, we'll do what we can to help. But I think it's the instincts and the access, you know, to the deals and people and, and thinking that, that I think is really exciting. And it's subtle, but you've got to invest about where things are actually going. And I think when you're tuned into music, uh, you know, I mean, music and sports, but, but these are mass market cultural, you know, phenomenons. And I think that sensibility is really helpful. And I love looking at what's going on, you know, in the Gen Z demographic, right? Because a lot of brands, they get a year, they get a year older every year. Like, you know, literally you lose three to, you know, two to 4% of your audience every year. It's because there's nobody that's younger that's coming in. And sometimes it's because everybody's focused on their core, core audience and that's getting older. But, you know, what's going on in the new generation? And, you know, we're also trying to really look at, at that, you know, and invest there. Yeah, definitely. And so now, now I want to get specifically into the pitching process, your experience with pitches. Um, well, so first off, so the types of pitches that I get as a journalist are very different from what you see as investors in part of, like in part because of like the, uh, what's contained inside. But I think there's some similar patterns. And one question that I want to ask now related to pitches is just like certain areas of, of music and tech being super saturated. So 
Uh, this year, I still get like tons of pitches about uh, VR, about ticketing, about like music discovery, especially, or like uh, people trying to build new consumer-facing streaming apps that are essentially trying to compete with the dozens and not hundreds of other services that are out there. It's definitely it's it's not like a bad idea at all. It's definitely addressing an important problem, but it's just so hard to sustain um, a company in areas like those where it's there are already so many other. Uh, competitors. So I'm wondering, are, are there s are there certain areas of music that engender a similar reaction from you where it's like you're kind of hands off from that because it's super saturated or because there's just too much activity going on or are you pretty much open to everything? What's your approach? I mean, I'll, I'll jump into this one. I mean, we've, we've been at it for nine months. We've looked at 700 plus companies since we started, actively looked at them, um, really dug in. And, um, and, and the truth of the matter is, you know when somebody is a qualified founder because you can tell that they have a very, very realistic presentation and point of view on what they are trying to build. What I mean by that is there's, there's people that, that start companies because they see holes in the music industry, having no real understanding of the music industry, not having spoken uh, with artists, with record labels, with managers to, to these guys' points earlier and just saying, well, wait a minute, you know, I love the music industry. Why is the music industry, you know, um, why are all the artists on Instagram and Snapchat and, and driving fans, you know, tens of millions of fans to those platforms without getting any financial participation? So my idea is, meaning theirs, my idea is I'm going to build an alternative social media platform and Ariana Grande is going to jump on there, and she's got 160 million fans or followers on Instagram. And you know what? My worst case scenario is 10% of them are going to come here, and this is going to help me launch this, right? I mean, that's like everyone in this room getting together and building like a new amusement park and being like, well, wait a minute, we build it. We have great rides, and no, we don't have Mickey Mouse, but we have, you know, Bitty Mouse, and, and everybody's going to stop going to Disneyland, and everybody's going to start coming here, right? I think the bottom line is, you know, the, there's there's you know, there's tons of verticals in the music industry that are outdated. For us, the thesis is we want to deal with founders who have a real understanding of the market, who have a real plan of 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 having a unique offering and a real plan of acquiring users. To uh, to Larry's point earlier, the th the theory of if we build it, they will come just because we believe ours is shinier than somebody else's is an absolute non-starter. To Sherry's point earlier, you know, it's nice to have artists involved, but if we see one more Nicki Minaj, uh, one more deck with Nicki Minaj on it, trying to, trying to hawk blockchain, um, you know, it's just, it's just like people like, oh, I got, I got an artist on this thing. It just shows us how disconnected from reality you are. You're actually turning us off by thinking that we're going to be like, oh, you have, you know, Cardi B trying to trying to do a new, you know, I don't know, whatever, right? Like, it's you got You have it has to be a real business if you really want to approach anybody on this stage or anybody else who's really in it. Be savvy about it. Have a real game plan. Don't think that we're going to be enticed by names. We see so many decks every day like, okay, Universal Music is already into this, and Warner is into this, and Sony's into this. These people don't understand that everyone who they mentioned, the heads of those companies for anybody on the stage is one text away. Or hey. We, or we only need a publishing deal or, or a licensing or deal. That's, that's it. Easy. And we, and we literally, in, within three minutes, we know exactly where each major music company and their head of innovation stands on your deck. We know exactly what, how committed they are. And 99 out of 100 times, oh, Universal is, is involved, all right. They've given you 300 songs to play with just to say that they gave you 300 songs to play with, just so that they say that they're being innovative. So assume, always assume that we know more than you. Not from a place of arrogance, not from a place of arrogance, but from a place of we do nothing but this. So, so, so please come at us with, with purpose, with authenticity, and with mutual respect. Great, and great I, comments. I would, I would, oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> I, would I would like to add maybe expertise also. It's maybe, um, you know, we are focused on rights tech. So for us, B2C music, uh, music tech, it's not something that we are looking at. But in the same time, 
when I receive deck, as you said, with no, it's very, for me, it's not Mickey, Nicki Minaj, but it's more about deals and licensing deal or publishing deal. Or it's going to be very, very easy because we just have to deal with DSPs. Right, it's going to take you maybe six months minimum. Um, or as you said about expertise and that we know better than you, it's true. And when I have calls with people that explain me, they explain me that they want to change the music industry or the metadata industry or, you know, licensing industry, and they don't know DDEX, for example. Yeah. Um, and I, d I remember a call, specific call, and at the end of the call I told them, yeah, but do you work with DDEX? Because it's exactly what, I mean, you are doing. And they told me no. So it's quite difficult to launch <laughs> a business if you don't know, you know, the 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 um, the people that, that are running the business. So it's yeah. it's really about the expertise and especially about copyrights. It's most of the time when I talk to people about copyright and rights organization and rights order and author rights, they don't know how it works in Europe. They don't know how it works in the U.S. Or um, I had one day I had a discussion with someone who wanted to change author rights in Europe because it was about it's quite complicated about exclusive mandate and something else. And I told him, yeah, but you know, it's uh, the Bern Convention. And he told me, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna t I'm, going, I'm going to sue it. Yeah. yeah, sue the Bern Convention if you want to. Right, go. <laughs> but we won't invest. <laughs> we won't help you. So it's really a question of expertise most of the time. Yeah. Great, great comments. I mean, there's one other uh, advice that I like to give founders. Know your landscape. Uh, one of the, the top three questions that I ask a founder is, so what's your competition? And John and I, we are on the road, like just nonstop. And we have three, three portfolio companies in Europe. We have six in the US, we have one in Canada. We meet everyone. We've, you know, we've met 1,100 companies since we, we started this. We've invested in 10. You, know, you have a better chance of getting into Harvard than getting our money, but we'll give you hugs. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, that, but, but that said, you know, knowing your landscape is really, really important um, because every, every CEO you know, out there thinks they, are, they have the solution that's unique and differentiated. And it's like, wait a minute, you're doing the same thing that these guys in Berlin are doing, but since you're based in LA, your valuation's five times more, so no thanks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in terms of you know, spaces and whatnot, I mean, I feel like one of the things I try to do every day is almost have like a clean slate and be open to things. Because interestingly, if you look at all of the great high value companies at the time they, they did those initial rounds, they were actually in very sort of bad overdone spaces, right? You know, search was very crowded and there wasn't a slot when Google started and social felt kind of crowded and dead you know, when Facebook started, and there were tons of streaming video companies, you know, when YouTube started. And I feel like it's easy to just say, oh, you know, you wanna be X, you know, a streaming music service, and say, all right, well, that's crowded, you know, and that's bad. But sometimes it's, it's the very subtle um, variations that make something break out. And it's really, you know, down to the team. And so, in, in my case, I'm really interested in seeing that the product is really working, that it has you know, very happy users, and that whatever you're doing is working and growing. I I'm, I'm just personally don't have a lot of interest in you know, kind of the ideas of why it's gonna be great. I'm interested in that once something is existing you know, that's really working. So you know, having revenue and users is really important, but if you know, you have something that's really special that's, you know, starting to really work, and, and that's something you can demonstrate, uh, and I can recognize that quickly, that's, you know, what gets me excited, is that, you know, that brand, that core experience is really going. And, you know, I used to have a, spend a lot of time on, a, on an investment thesis, like I was a sell-side equity analyst, and sort of like, okay, here's what's going on in games, and this whole point of view. But now, I feel like, you know, if you look backwards and you think about whatever predictions you had in your brain and what's actually happened, I think you kind of have to admit that the world is just changing at this crazy pace that's pretty unpredictable. And you look at a lot of human behaviors and it's like, wow, I can't believe that's really going on, you know, at scale and how quickly mobile and connectivity came on and just became ubiquitous and the implications. So 
you know, I think it's more like what you're doing and, you know, your vision. And if you're executing on that, you know, that's something, you know, we're, we're really excited to look at. Cool. Um, I think we have around five minutes, so I actually want to open it up to questions because I'm sure the founders in the room have a lot of questions. We'll also be around after, but if anyone had anything they want to ask now. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the panel. Super interesting. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, what you think about uh, the role of AI and its future in the music industry. It's a big question. <laughs> uh, anyone want to... We've looked at probably five AI companies uh, across Europe and um, in the, the US. Most of the music isn't that good, but I think it can get better. And there are great applications. Um, licensing has been a challenge, um, as you may have heard from my counterpart over here. Um, but you know, there's a lot of applications for this AI music, right? Car commercials or uh, movie spots or you know there's other places where you would hear this music and it's kind of white noise so to speak but you know I, am, I'm, or is it ever going to get to a point where you're getting a you know a, a top top charted song that's made by AI I don't know not maybe not um, in the near future but it's it's possible so it does have a role absolutely but I think AI can be used more importantly as a tool to help guide artists and I think that's the real application. So you know, you're you're a producer in the studio, and the AI will give you ideas to jog your mind. And then that it's like your friend in the studio that helps you um, think of cool ideas, and then finally come to something that makes sense for you as as an artist. Uh, Connie Chen from Andreessen Horowitz put out a a white paper, and she's speaking about uh, multimodal monetization in media and music where you've got uh, you know, Spotify and subscription on one end and ad support on the other. She has this theory uh, that China's pioneered multimodal monetization. Uh, I'm uh, interested in comments on that. So I, I want you all to weigh in as well, but we were talking backstage about how, yeah, the like companies like Tencent Music, um, yeah, have actually successfully closed the gap or combined like music and gaming mechanics in really interesting ways that just has not happened here. I'm thinking if you, um, were at like Mark's talk earlier today. Um, he also said like the, basically the dominant streaming model, the consumption model in the U.S. is everyone has to buy a Lexus and you just choose the paint, right? It's like very homogenous. But uh, yeah, I, I personally think there's a huge opportunity to um, just just put more options on the table because if you look, so this is not really in the world of VC, but even companies like Bandcamp are doing so well because they have a pay what you want model. Just even like like having that option. Um, and seeing that fans are paying more than the you know, suggested average that artists will list on their albums on the site goes a long way for the company and for the artists as well. So, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other yeah, comments on that. You know, here's an example, karaoke, right? That's a massive part of Tencent's business. But, you know, where is karaoke in the U.S., right? I think culture between East and West, as, as Mark said this morning, is, is a very, very important uh, role in this, right? So is it China or is it the culture of China? So I think that's the key distinction. Uh, this is Constantine from Dot Music. Um, I have a question on the question of profitability versus growth. Um, is it important to make a profit? So you look at companies like Spotify, Uber, Lyft, all these big companies that a lot of investors show off about that never make any money. I'd like to know, uh, given also, uh, the iOS and the, the obviously the App Store and uh, uh, Google Play, where they take 30% of everything. Uh, what do you guys think in terms of profitability versus growth? Is it about growing a company and selling it to one of the big boys, or is it about profit? I, mean, I think that as long as you have alignment between yourself, what you're building, and your investors, and there's transparency and alignment on the strategy, I think that's at the end of the day, that's all that matters. I mean, obviously, I don't want to be cliched. We've seen what happened with, with WeWork over the past, you know, couple of weeks. We see where Uber potentially could be going by simply focusing on growth versus profits. On the other hand, we've seen what Amazon has done, selling their shareholder on the vision of long-term growth versus profitability. But at the same time, whether it's skill, whether it's luck, whether it's a combination of the two, you know, giving birth to the vertical of AWS, which now is going to become a profitable company from what we're all seeing. So I think ultimately, you know, I think there's caution in the marketplace at this particular point when we're talking about 
growth versus versus margins. But I think ultimately, when it comes down to you know when you're when you're sitting in one of our seats up here, it's really about alignment with uh, with the founders. I think both are, are very very important. Um, you need a, a credible, and I highlight the word credible, a credible path to. Uh, revenue and profitability, and I like to cite the example of SoundCloud. Right, SoundCloud, um, you know, it was all about growth, 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 but on the users. But they'd never got uh, got it together on the monetization side, and you know, they did you know Series A, B, C, D, E, F, all, you know, all the way to you know a billion dollar valuation, and then they're like, holy shit, how do we make any money? And guess what? They got a down route fed up to them so hard, you know, it, it devalued the entire company. So, you know, if if they if there was no credible path towards how we're actually going to monetize our user base, well, that's a challenge. So you need to have both in both in mind. It's I think it's a really important question, and the main answer is uh, both is best. Yeah. Love that. And if you don't have profitability, you know, you better have growth. And I think the unit economics are really interesting to look at. And you know, if you a lot of businesses, I mean, it, it really just comes down to customer acquisition cost and LTV for you know ongoing businesses. If you have a six-month payback, you know, every month you're going to lose six months of cash acquiring those users. But if it's positive LTV, meaning you're going to make the money back, you know, in 18 months. You actually want to grow quickly, and the quicker you grow, the more money you're going to lose. So any subscription business that enters hypergrowth is actually going to need a lot of cash to fuel that growth. But you're not just you know, tossing negative gross margin money at people. You know, you're investing in that long-term LTV. And sometimes it's prospective LTV you know, based on a key cohort. Right? You made it work in city one, and you know, You've seen how that moves, and it's getting better in city two. Um, so I think, in general, markets pay a lot more for growth than profitability. And businesses that aren't growing basically end up, you know, in kind of one-time sales, six, you know, to eight times EBITDA sort of mode. If you look, I mean, that's where all companies kind of go. So the question is, how big can they be by the time they get there? And that goes back to your growth rate. And I, I don't know if that actually made sense to anybody. Um, <laughs> I may be <laughs> literally totally disconnected from how people are thinking about this, but if, if you have another question on that, let me know after. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this special episode of the Music Tectonics podcast with a recording from the Music Tectonics conference, which took place October 2019 in Los Angeles. To keep apprised of other recordings from the conference and our upcoming 2020 dates for the conference, please hit subscribe to your favorite podcast app. I'd like to send a special thank you to our supernova sponsors of the Music Tectonics conference, AdRev, CD Baby, and Hydric, and to our star sponsors, Lyric Find and Hyper Wallet. And to everybody who came out and made the first conference a great success, check out the Seismic Shift trading cards on our website. And if you go to musictectonics.com, sign up for our newsletter where you can keep apprised of upcoming podcast episodes, blog posts, and other events we're doing. Thanks for listening. You're listening to Music Tectonics.